Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. The reading that I have is adjusted to reflect the original Hebrew. So please listen for God's word. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the human from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there God put the human whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flows from the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedillium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows from the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the human and put them in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the human... You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Name. The human gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the human there was not found a helper as their partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human and they slept. Then God took one of the human's ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, God made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. As I mentioned in the introduction today, we're beginning a new year of scripture readings from what is called the Narrative Lectionary. And um, so we'll be reading through the Old Testament Hebrew Bible till um, Advent and Christmas. And then after Christmas, we will start uh, reading through a gospel till Easter. And then after Easter, we'll read through New Testament letters and that'll take us to Memorial Day or Pentecost. The narrative lectionary, as you notice, uses longer passages of scripture than the revised common lectionary does. And that allows us to emphasize the bigger story of the Bible, helping us connect our lives to that broader sweep of the biblical narrative. Some of these stories you'll hear this year may be new for you and others may feel very familiar. And I invite us all to hear each of these stories as if we're hearing them for the first time. And don't let what you thought you knew about it keep you from hearing what God might be saying to you today. And so we start at the very beginning, a very fine place to start, as Julie Andrews might say, or almost the very beginning. The creation story from Genesis, which we heard, is a continuation of the other creation story in Genesis 1. In the first creation story, God speaks and the world comes into being. Here in this story, God shows us the act of creation, shows us what creation means, and shows us why it matters. The creation stories in Genesis, to be clear, were never intended to be a historical reporting of the very first day of the universe. 
The creation stories help us understand our place in the world and our reason for being in the world. They are why stories, not how stories. Walter Brueggemann, one of my seminary professors, says the creation stories are about humans' destiny as God's creation to live in God's creation with God's other creatures on God's terms. And so the story of us as human begins in a garden. Humans were told to put, were put in the garden to till it and to keep it. Work is not punishment. Work is part of who we are. It's also not all of who we are. It is a part of who we are. And the work to which we are called is not unlike the work that God does. It's not exactly the same, of course, but it is similar. In our creation, God shows us how to work. In order to make the first human, God got down on their divine knees and knelt in the dirt and formed humans out of the mud. The word for the human in this section is Adam, or Adam, if you heard Adam and Eve, right? That's where that word comes from. It means out of the dust. Similarly, when woman was created, God put the human, Adam, into a deep sleep, opened him up, took out his rib, and formed the woman into being too. And the work of creation is dirty, and it is messy. God's hands certainly got messy in the dust and mud and open rib cages and blood and guts. In the creation of humanity, God is involved and not sitting on a throne somewhere at a remove. God is on their knees, playing in the dirt, creating us, showing us how to be creative, full of love and hope. It is tilling a garden in order to bring life. And many of you work in gardens. In my last church in Boise, I would have to lock my car doors, not because I was afraid it was going to be robbed, but because they would fill it with zucchinis this time of year. <laughs> but working in garden has great health benefits, truly. Getting your hands dirty, playing in the soil, even if it's just potted plants in your house, walking in nature is good for your health. And it is messy work. It requires bending down into the garden bed to pull weeds, pulling the bugs off of leaves, scrubbing the dirt out from under your fingernails. The tilling and keeping of a garden is labor, and God showed us how to do it by making us. Now, humans aren't exactly the same as tomato plants, but light and a little water and proximity to marigolds is as good for us as it is for tomatoes. But I wonder if God knew exactly what God was creating when God was busy making us out of the mud and ribs and bailing wire and duct tape and whatever else they use to put us together. Because humanity is not as predictable as tomato plants. I read the news and one minute we're doing horrible things to each other. War and gun violence and callous disregard for the plights of our fellow humans. But the next minute I read stories of such surprising compassion and love toward the stranger, we are a creation of contradictions. We never know how another is going to respond. In the dust of war-torn places, places where we might expect nothing good to grow, compassion and love may be the dominant trait in people. And in clean neighborhoods where dust is meticulously banished, where every opportunity is provided, people may exhibit nothing but violence and hypocrisy. The growing of humans is clearly complicated work. And so the creation story in Genesis calls us to attend to that. And it reminds us how important and how complicated it is for us to live together. God instructs the human that they may eat freely of any tree in the garden. God is generous with that permission an entire garden for the human to enjoy and to work and to care for. And there is one tree in the garden that the human could not eat from. The freedom we have in God's creation is large, but it is not complete. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil often gets a lot of attention in this story. And your guess is as good as mine for why the tree, what kind of tree it was, or why God put it smack dab in the middle of the garden if they didn't want us to touch it. 
perhaps we would not put it right in the middle of the garden if we didn't want people to mess with it, but it just serves to remind us that it is not our garden and God's ways are not our ways. But to emphasize the forbiddenness of that one tree while ignoring the provision of the entire rest of the garden seems to be mischaracterizing the intentions of God. God gives humanity a whole lot of permission, a lot of freedom in that garden. An entire garden minus one tree is ours to enjoy and from which we can be fed. And yet it remains God's garden and our relationship to God remains what it was at the beginning We are the creatures in the garden made with love out of the mud and the dust. So do we see God primarily as a God who prohibits or a God who gives permission? This is an important question for us to answer because if we see God setting humanity loose in a garden that with some labor and care will provide for them, then we have permission to see our lives that way, in a way that allows for us to be creative in our own working, in our own tilling of our own gardens. We trust that God has provided and will continue to provide, and we can set aside our anxiety and our fears of scarcity because there's enough for all. But if we see God setting humanity loose in a garden that is full of snares and traps and punishment, the punishment of work, then we worry about getting it right and pleasing God, who is a God who is trying to trick us into getting it wrong. We work only for ourselves. We separate ourselves from each other and we worry there won't be enough because we don't trust God's provision only in God's prohibition. So we hear stories in the news of people who I am sure are well-meaning and doing the best they can, just as we are, but they have been taught that God will be displeased with them if they get it wrong or if they allow somebody else to get it wrong. The way we understand the garden story informs the entirety of our lives and how we treat the rest of the people in our garden. God says it is not good for the human to be alone, and that's why we have dogs and cats and hedgehogs and the deer and the antelope playing. God puts all of these animals in the garden and the human names them. They are given as helpers and companions, and they're great, but they're no woman, am I right? (laughs) Those creations were not enough. And so the woman is made out of the man's side, and it is only once another human is there in the garden that the words man and woman show up in the story, Ish and Isha, different from Adam. The translations of your Bible don't capture the moment that changes, and that's why I had Joanne read one that was interpreted closer to the Hebrew. It is only once another person is in the garden that you hear the voice of the human speak. Language is a product of community. We need each other to speak, to communicate. The community we have with each other is a gift of God that starts in the very beginning of the story, right in the garden. The woman is created as a helper for the man. And for many years, that word has been reduced to a sense of helper as someone who picks up dry cleaning and washes the dishes, both of which are things that I appreciate as help when they are offered, to be clear. But the word is bigger than that. Ezer means a helper of strength. Moses names one of his sons Eliezer, which means God is my helper. And it's not because God folded Moses' laundry. It's because God saved Moses' life. At its, word, word, sorry, at its root, the word translated as helper means to rescue and to be strong. Wherever else this word occurs in scripture after this passage, God is the helper. God is the one who comes alongside to save us. So there's a sentence at the end of this passage you might have noticed about a man leaving his mother and father and joining his woman, which is odd at this point in the narrative because Adam and Eve, of course, did not have a mother and a father. <laughs> it's understandable that we hear this passage and we think of marriage. It's been read at enough weddings for sure. But this passage is not about being single or being married. The community we have with each other with the other beautiful things God has made out of the mud does not require marriage. 
It is about being connected to each other and helping each other through life. We are already connected because God has made us from and for each other from the very beginning. We are helpers, strong to save for each other. It's not good for the human to be alone. That's a reminder, as the poet said, that no one is an island unto itself. We are connected one to the other by the God who formed us. We have a tendency, though, to pretend that the concerns and problems of other people are not ours. People who cannot afford food or housing in our city are people. They're our people, and their concerns are ours. We participate in a food bank, and we serve at shelters, and we hope you'll sign up to join and help us. We advocate for better housing measures because we are created to be their helpers. People legally seeking asylum at our border are our people and their concerns are our concerns. Sign up to help the Sanctuary Committee if you want to participate in this ministry. There's even a hearing on Monday at 11 o'clock in the morning. If you want more information about that, talk to Victor. We were created to be their helpers. Students and teachers being shot in school in Georgia this past week. These are our people being killed at the altar of gun violence and gun worship, but we were created to be their helper. We need to demand change from our congressional leaders now. If we pretend we are not connected, we are ignoring the story of the garden. It is not good for the human to be alone. The story of the garden reminds us to care to and respond to the plight of people we do not know and may never meet. Not because we share their politics or religion, but because God created them out of the mud too. God put them in our garden with us. We are created to be each other's helpers. So who and how can you help this week? Maybe, like me, you need the reverse of this question. Who can you allow to help you this week? Where in your life could you use a little help? If we are created to help each other, it also means we acknowledge that we sometimes are on the receiving end of assistance. As a child, my most used phrase, according to my parents, was, I can do it me own self, and um, often was uttered as I had stuck both of my feet into one leg of my tights, where I would say, both a feet's in one, daddy, and I can do it me own self. I am probably still more a little independent than I should be, but I know I need help. From my husband and kids, from my coach and my counselor, from my friends and my colleagues, I am a healthier person when I have support. And it's not just that I need help, it's that other people are sometimes better suited to do something than I am. I was here last week to participate in Show Tunes Sunday, but that is something that Victor and Michael and John and the choir were able to plan and carry out with far greater skill than I could ever dream of doing. It would have been ridiculous to have me plan Show Tunes Sunday. It made all the sense in the world to have the people that know the Show Tunes plan the Sunday. Being a helper and being helped is a way of acknowledging that everyone brings different gifts to the table. And if we don't let each other use our particular gifts, we are all missing out. So as you go through your week, I invite you to think about the ways we choose to be in community with others and the ways we pretend that we don't have to be. I invite you to reconsider this particular biblical story and to reclaim it from the sexist and patriarchal ways you may have heard it used before because it is too important a story for us to keep telling badly. And I invite you to dig out your Bibles, dust them off, and follow along this year as we read through it. And if you need a Bible, please let Joanne or Victor or I know and we'll get you one. Friends, our story as people of faith begins in a garden, one where we are made out of the dirt of the earth. It is a great story, and I'm glad to be a part of it with you, glad to have you as my helpers in this corner of God's garden. Let us get our hands dirty helping each other.